What spooks me out personally even more than the dark star that's talked about, and this is a little bit more along the lines of my research over the past six years at least. I used to get into this a lot more with nanotechnology, mind control combined with nanotechnologies, and it was all basically a hypothesis associated with AI interface. You know, I talk about DNA breaking down into a quad code system, how there's sacred geometry found throughout the universe, how quantum physics, there's really no finite point. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if space is infinite, then size doesn't really matter. In a sense, how could one thing be bigger than the other in infinite space? What he gets into is somebody that he actually used to work with that helped build over 200 harp-like facilities around the world. The information he talks about with the artificial interface, the nanotechnologies combined with the chemtrails, they're not actually nano-goblins in the sense of being full-on nano-robots at first, but the way they combine with the DNA and other elements, they can essentially turn into these micro-antennas. The geoengineering of the planet, we talk about the radiation levels increasing how and why it feels more intense on your skin when the sun reaches the skin, even though the temperature's the same. The Anunnaki, we get in deep into the Anunnaki interface, who they are, how they've been talked about in different biblical prophecies and scriptures with different names, different terms. How Terrell also feels that over the next certain amount of years, depending on when these events absolutely do take place, in his opinion, he thinks that they will. He thinks it's going to be like the movie 2012, and California is a very bad place to be, in his opinion. Magna waves, the heliosphere shrinking, the reversing magnetosphere, what's going to happen around May 20th, 2017. Connecting numbers, earthquakes, earth changes seamlessly and efficiently. This might be the podcast that changes your mind on the possibility of a binary star that causes huge events, and many consider this being God this being God's reset button. He also talks about where the earth change warning signs will be if you're in the US and what to look for. So make sure to listen to that. Is the president of the Council of Foreign Relations actually the enforcer of U.S. control in Denver? What about the Bilderberg Group, the House of Foreign Relations, the House of Rothschild? Is the Georgia Guidestones 500 million people, no more than that at any given time on the planet of Earth, a precursor to the Black Star Nemesis Wormwood Planet X Nibiru? What's going to happen? Is it even worth living through these cataclysms? This is discussed with Terrell as well as Jay here today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine timelord. If you become a contributing member at leakproject.com, you'll get access to exclusive content and contributions greatly help Leak Project. Pick up a high resolution decal today for 10 bucks as well. High quality vinyl. We've got several other really cool decals coming up here soon. Check them out on our website, leakproject.com. Also, check out Terrell's website once again, terrell03.com. He's also on YouTube. Just look up the Dark Star and Jay Campbell, trtrevolution.com. The Game Changer with Testosterone Replacement Therapy. Enjoy the presentation. This is Rex Bear. Question everything and be the change you want to see. Hey guys, what is going on? It is Jay Campbell from trtrevolution.com and the author of the Definitive Testosterone Replacement Therapy Manual. And of course, I'm joined by my awesome friend, Rex Bear of The Leak Project. This is the episode, Decoders of Truth, episode 14. And we have, we're joined tonight by a very special guest. It is Terrell of terrell03.com. And Terrell is a very, very prominent guy in the, um, I guess you would call it black star, orbital passage, or, orbital passage um, theory of uh, an inbound body. And we're going to let him talk a lot about that tonight. So again, um, we're very, very excited, both Rex and I. Uh, Terrell, how are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. Doing very good. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, so let's just get right into it. So I want, you know, uh, Rex and I are going to do our job of kind of going back and forth and having questions from Terrell. And Terrell, you probably know Rex interviews a lot of guys like you who have stories 
about the brew, you know, Gerald Clark, Marshall Masters, Steve Olson, all these different guys out there. Um, so he's, you know, really excited to interview you. So let's just talk a little bit about your background first. How did you get into this? I'm actually a Bible guy. I'm a, more of a theologian, a, a Bible scholar, a student, and worked with scripture for decades. Thought that would be my life's work. Wrote my book in 2005, The Mystery Explained. You can get it free at terralo3.com. And then uh, once that was completed, the burden was on my heart to know the truth about 9-11. So that was a five-year investigation. And then wrote that book in 2010. And uh, you can get that free also, The 9-11 Truth Exposing the Cheney Rumsfeld Black Operation. And then uh, Allen and Comet was discovered. And after keywording scripture and the 9-11 Commission Report, Arden County After Action Report, then in developing these skills, then uh, the documentation came out about the Ellen and Comet discovered December 10th, 2010. Ellen and backwards is 9-11. And the perihelion date of this, uh, this supposed comet was 9-11-2011, exactly 10 years to the day after the 9-11 attacks. So I just wrote the book, and then here comes this story. So it was the documentation relating to Ellen and that really got me into it. I joined two astronomy groups, want to know more, educate myself on astronomy more. And then um, Minister Armour Bossage came out with his paper to Cornell April 11th. He traced uh, this Ellen and Comet was included in his paper that he'd been working on for a very long time. And he traced the seismic pattern going back to 1965, which obviously didn't happen because of a comet. It just so happens this celestial object, this object, gravitational magnetic anomaly that I've been tracking now for the last six years was in Leo at the same time as the Ellen and Comet. And I believe that Ellen and Comet is a lettered agency PSYOP that they ran to desensitize people, very similar to the, the comet ISON. And um, so I've been engaged in the documentation and then we picked up a, our project astronomer, uh, Don, and worked with a large research group for years. And it, it, it just kind of grabbed me and uh, I'm gonna be on this project until it's finally resolved. There's definitely something coming, definitely something coming. It's causing the earth changes. It's causing um, everything from global warming to Jupiter's liquefying core to uh, the volcanism you're seeing, the earthquakes in the quake pattern that we're seeing, the magnetopause reversals that we've been having. We're predicting them now in advance because we have enough baseline data. And um, that's really how I got into the uh, investigation. So, so let me ask you a real quick question. So you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that Ellen and, and Ison are both psyops and they're both, they're both a cover story for the same thing, which is the inbound object, which you call um, it. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Ellen and passed on through. The okay. seismic pattern continued. So the reason, the, the way that they use these psyops is to desensitize the population. So you've heard Nibiru, Planet X, the lettered agencies are running both sides of that. And everybody's hearing it so much that they're becoming desensitized to it. So the plan is to put everybody to sleep and to make them look at Hillary and Trump and whatever the reruns are running on the television rather than waking up about what's coming from space. Okay, so, you, so, I, so if I'm understanding you correctly, again, I apologize. So you're saying that Ellen was a comet. And it did pass through. So no, it was, Ison was a comet. Ellen was not a comet. Okay, try to, okay. Just try to find a picture of it. Okay, I, I got you. I got you. So, so right. Ellen was this black star, mm -hmm. but Ison was a comet. That's right. Okay. Wow. But there's a lot of similarities. They were both discovered by Russians. The first hyperbolic comet discovered by a Russian was, was Ellen, and the second one would have been Ison, except for they ran out of time. There's a 72 hour time limit for them to get. Um, uh, corroboration from other astronomers and they missed it by about two hours of identifying this thing as a comet. So that's why it was named after the network, the ISON network. Turned out to be a dirty snowball, but uh, James McKinney ran with that and it was a mini solar system. If you remember, both of them were mini solar systems. If you look up the, the keywording for the documentation on both of them and too many similarities for them not to be connected. And it, it was another desensitizing op that the lettered agencies ran. If you notice, McKinney left Planet X movement shortly after after that. So he, he was used as a vessel for a little while. And then he, like Lucas, that came before him. If you've been watching John Moore, listening to John Moore, then it was Lucas 2011. I remember and, Lucas. Yeah. I interviewed him and, back in the day. And he was really big into it. He came to Revolution Radio where, where I do my work. And um, then he was replaced by James McCanny. And I expected him, them to replace McCanny with someone else, a little higher level NASA type guy. And uh, that, that didn't happen. But um, both of those were psyops. Uh, used to desensitize the population in my mind. You know, let me jump in real quick because I've often thought that the desensitization process started way before even 2003. Because if you play cry wolf long enough, eventually no one's going to believe it. And even if they do believe it, they just don't want to hear it anymore because they've heard it for so long. So like you said, it's this desensita uh, desensitization process. But let me ask you this. As far as the charts and stuff that you're going to share with us here, 
And the, I, I had a whole bunch of earthquake reports the other day that somebody sent in. I'm talking dozens around the West Coast, all the way up into Alaska. And then you've got the Ring of Fire, obviously. Are we going to get to a point to where you think that it's going to be similar to the film 2012 on the West Coast? Absolutely. It's going to happen. The dominoes are already stacked against the U.S. West Coast in the entire United States. After that, after Yellowstone pops, then you have lava tubes running over to the New Madrid, and New Madrid's going to pop. If you look at the Scalia maps of the future, look at the Navy maps of the future, you'll see a giant hole out there where you guys live, and you're going to see there's an inland gulf from where Louisiana used to be all the way up to the Great Lakes. So the United States is going to be cut in two by what's about to happen. I've seen those maps, and I know that even Edgar Casey had a basically a vision where he was in one of his trances, and he had a similar map to the released Navy maps. And a lot of people that were in the military, higher in, you know, top brass, etc., officers ended up moving out towards that location that's looked at as safer. And you know, definitely you want to be at a high elevation if something like that happens. But where are we at now? I mean, are there some charts essentially that kind of show where the dark star is at? Because so many people are thinking what they take a picture of is Planet X or Nibiru or Wormwood or, you know, these multiple names, Red Kachina, Blue Kachina, et cetera. Right. And that's a lot of the propaganda. There are no pictures of the black star. There's no pictures of the black star. You cannot photograph what is a black hole. This thing is more like a black hole than any known celestial object. So it's like sucking stuff into another dimension? No, I'm not going to say that. What we're dealing with is- That sounds really crazy awesome. This is a remnant body. This is the, our sun's much larger binary twin that burned out long, long, long time ago. And when it imploded, then it created this remnant body that comes to the inner solar system. It came to the inner sol solar system in the days of Noah, and it came in the days of Moses, and it's coming now to begin the day of the Lord, and then it's going to come again at the end of the age to fulfill Matthew 24 and Revelation. The sun's going to turn dark. The moon's not going to give forth this light. The earth is going to stagger like a drunkard, and the U.S. West Coast is in the bullseye of where the dominoes are already stacked against the United States. So, 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 um, wow, this is very somber, um, especially living in Southern California, but, um, so what is your take then on, you know, obviously all the other, um, you know, researchers, again, Gerald Clark, Zachariah Sitchin, uh, Michael Tellinger, folks like that, you know, who talk about this, you know, inbound object, you know, they refer to it as Nibiru, um, wormwood, you know, whatever, planet X, um, and, 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 the, and the, you know, this, the beings or the species that supposedly come with it, the Anunnaki. What is your belief in the Anunnaki? I believe the aliens are all around us. I believe they're God's custodians. You asked me earlier what they were going to do with the nuclear power plants. Who's going to clean up the mess? That's who's going to clean up the mess. This is the same people that took Elijah to heaven in a chariot of fire in 2 Kings chapter 2, start at verse 10. Those people are all around us right now, but they're not going to interfere. But once the black star passes through, they're the ones that are going to clean up the mess. So when you say clean up the mess, I'm sorry if I'm cutting you off, Rex. Go ahead to inter inter stop me here a second. But when you say clean up the mess, are you saying um, pick up the pieces after a new, new, uh, millions, if not billions, of people are done? Yes, that's what they're going to do. And it's going to start the day of the Lord. It doesn't matter who dies. Remember that uh, Christ's first miracle was to turn water into wine. Elijah's first miracle was to raise the dead. It doesn't matter who dies. The, we're, we're moving into something that's new. That's what this black star is. It's God's reset button. And we're, we're dividing times. It divides times from times. If you notice before Noah, people live much longer. Then afterwards, they live shorter after, after Moses. So the, the number of years that man lives is divided by times. And these times, all of a sudden, when this thing leaves, people are going to start to live to be a thousand years again. So we're actually standing on the edge, the threshold of something very glorious. Go ahead, Rex. You know, I would like to know what your take is on some dates that people could expect to see that type of stuff happen on a global scale, similar to the film 2012 again. Okay, the, we know the month that it's going to happen. We know that it's going to be in the month of May because we know the black star. If you'd like me to show you the solar system. Are you guys still looking at my desktop? Oh, yeah. Okay, if, if you'd like for me to show you the uh, solar system, then I can answer some of those questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Please do. Okay. So... It looks, it looks like my settings are not set. Let's set them so you can see the constellations. And then we want you to see how we can already see the planets. Okay. Whenever this thing was discovered, it was in the Leo constellation. And there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of data that we're basing what I'm telling you on. So this is where the, where Ellen was discovered, and this, was, this is where the black star was in 2010. This thing is moving left in the orbit diagram just below 
the ecliptic plane. See, we're looking at the plane right now, going up and down. It's just below the ecliptic plane. The reason they're building these telescopes at the South Pole is so that when the Earth bobs, you see it's a little bit above the plane right now. When it's down below the plane, then they can look across below all the debris that's on the plane to get a better look at the thing that, that's coming from space. But the where it came from, actually, is, from what I can tell, just about at the belt of Orion back over this way, and it's coming along this way, it's moving in prograde fashion, which means the same direction as the rest of the planets, and the belt of Orion down here. It's, not, it's, it's going to be above that, but it, it came from Orion, and it's coming across this way. I picked it up in Leo six years ago, and we've been predicting the seismic patterns. My investigation started in January of 2011, and we predicted Fukushima with only two months of data within four days. The next year, it was Guerrero when the black star was just about here. And we predicted that within two days. And the reason that it's happening is because the Earth, as it comes around in orbit, like so, and when it passes between the stars, then that's when we have our big seismic events. We're also at our nearest point to the star. So for example, this year, we made the predictions. And when the black star, we know when we're in outside orbit position, we know whenever the magnetic portal connection between the black star and the Earth is at its longest. That's when we have the least number of earthquakes. And then whenever the Earth is moving towards the black star, just like this, it's in Libra now. So in the month of April, we had all these earthquake events and we had nine new volcanic eruptions. We had seven, eight, nine, and nine volcanic weekly new events in the month of April. But whenever the Earth is around here in August, we only had one and two. And the reason is because the Earth was very close to the black star. There's a magnetic portal connection if you don't know what that is, you can go to my website. Lots of data on it. There's a link you can click. It's like an umbilical cord running from the Earth to the Sun. There's, and inside of that magnetic portal connection, there are two primary kinds of conduits, active conduits and passive conduits. The passive conduits line the outside. The internal conduits are the active ones. And the Earth receives the most amount of electromagnetism through that magnetic portal connection when we're the closest to the Sun. That's on January the 3rd or the 4th. And then uh, when we, we moved to the summer side of orbit, then we received less. The same principles apply for the black star. It's out here. It's connected to our sun through a magnetic portal connection. So you know solar cycle 24 flatlined in late 2011. They said we had a double peak in 2015, which we did not. But, and now it's void of sunspots, which it shouldn't be. The reason is because the black star is siphoning the energy from the sun, and it's redirecting it to the other planets through a secondary set of magnetic portal connections. Ju that's why Jupiter is changing. That's why they sent the, Ju the Juno probe there. That's why you can't see the spot on Jupiter anymore because the complexion's changing. The things, the ethane, the methane, the solids in the core are liquefying. They're actually being changed directly into gas and it is causing Jupiter to grow. Its upper atmosphere is changing, its complexion. Similarly with Mars, when Mars came by in 2012, Mars was right behind and I can change the date here and show you. Let's go back to 2012, right here. Let's go to March. And you'll see Mars is directly behind the Earth here. So, Terrell, did you build this software right here? Did you, did you... Oh, no. No, this is a solar system scope. You can get it for free on the Internet. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So, the black stars behind Mars on March the 12th, 2012. I've got it on March the 10th, but March the 12th. Very important day in my investigation because not only did Mars develop a dust storm on the night's time side of the – that's why it's a mystery Martian dust storm because scientists today don't know why, what caused it. It's that was a be... nasty storm, too, by the way. It's, caused, it's supposed to be caused by the solar wind. It's supposed to be happening on this side, not on the backs on the nighttime side. But this storm started on March the 12th, 2012, at the same time that Earth magnetosphere turned around. The bow shock faces the sun. The tail is supposed to point this way. It blows in the solar wind. For 28 hours, our magnetosphere turned around. And the bow shock faced the Leo constellation, the same constellation where my black star was. Big, strong evidence. And it happened just before the Guerrero event that we predicted within two days. So here comes the Earth. It's getting ready to pass between the black star and the sun, and it's pulling two magnetic portal connections with it, the one from the Earth to the sun, the one from the black star to the Earth, and it crossed the star-to-star -star magnetic portal connection. As it did, it caused magnetic portal connection convergence. This angle was 45-degree angle back here. But when we started moving between the two, that angle got smaller and smaller, and the convergence of those portal connections causes portal-to-portal -portal cross firing, a sprite formation, the biggest lightning bolts that you can imagine between these portal connections. That creates highly charged ionic clouds being given direction between the, the, the converging portals. So this big giant wave was pushed through towards the sun, causes solar flares. We had giant solar flares leading up to this too. And the fact that this happened just before Guerrero, 
the Guerrero event happened just after it. It happened eight days after it. Then that tells us that we had definitely had the magnetic portal connection. We had the solar flares and the Earth magne the magnetosphere turning around. That tells us that we have a source of subatomic particles here that is more powerful than the solar wind that could not possibly originate outside of the pressure shock of our solar system. It's impossible. The, the influence had to be very nearby in order to fight the solar wind at just one astronomical unit from the sun. So then in 2016, using that data, we were able to predict what happened. Let's go to 2016. And we were able to predict the Martian dust storms. If I can get this to go the right way, here we go. In April. Here's Mars again. Here's Mars again. Behind the Earth. Behind the Earth. I'm getting double I'm feedback. Getting double feedback from echo. From echo. Okay, so here comes the Earth again like this. The magnetosphere collapsed again. The reason that it's characterized as a collapse rather than a reversal is because NASA turned off the feed. The Department of Homeland Security actually turned off the feed after only two hours. We, we had 28 hours of data last time. We only had two this time. Martian dust storm started just prior. The Earth's magnetosphere collapsed again because the black star had moved. You see where we are now? This is the Virgo constellation before it was in Leo. So not only this, we have a seismic pattern that I could show you from this recent newsletter. We've been f tracking the earthquakes weekly, and we know when they're going to go up and when they're going to go now, down, when we're going to have the big uptick and when we're going to have the lull period. And we're in an uptick period, a mini lull inside of an uptick period right now, if you listen to my report. So this is the kind of data. Let's take this down just for a minute and look at the newsletter. This is just this is year-over-year year seismic values. They're extremely low at this point because something is coming. The, the, the patterns that we're looking at, says that there is something coming and it's kind of looking in your direction. But here's an example. This O in the chart means we're at outside orbit position. That's at that 90 degree angle position that I told you about. Look at how low the values are. 2.5 to 4 magnitude earthquakes, sub 200 is very rare. Look down the chart. Look down the chart. You can, you can barely see a 100 something. At outside orbit position is when it happens. Back in 2011, this value was 146. The next year was 164. The next year is 176. It's been migrating upwards, but very slowly. Then we have a jolt value. The highest value of the year, sometimes this second week, is because of the way that Earth turns around in orbit to start moving towards the black star, and then we get a sudden jolt of electromagnetism. That gives us that jolt value. This happens. It's very predictable in the chart. This jolt value here, five, six magnitude earthquakes, this happens like clockwork. In the fifth week, not the fifth week of the year, see, this doesn't start on January the 1st. This starts when we get the outside orbit position. So the chart for the next year begins almost two weeks later. Here we are at outside orbit position. There was a little bit of anomaly. This value was a, little bit, was a little bit high here to start this year. But whenever you look at, the, when it, look at all the earthquake activity that we're having when we get between the two stars, here we're having 11 of the six magnitude earthquakes, three, four sevens, five sevens right here together. Whenever we have these longer areas, we have none at all. You're, if you're anywhere near outside orbit position, then that's the way that it is. We have almost nothing as far as earthquake activity. So we were able to predict far in advance because we know the solar system. We know where we are in the solar system going around the sun and when we're moving towards the black star. And whenever we come around and to get the outside orbit position over here, we move around and swing around in orbit, which we just went through, the black star is moving directly towards us. That means the magnetic portal connection is shortening on two times a year and it's lengthening two times a year. And we have identified the seismic pattern that tells us this is caused by a celestial object. And the same celestial object that turned Earth's magnetosphere around the same celestial object that I've been tracking for the last six years. Wow. Let me jump in real quick. If Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. So, I mean, this is some great data and much appreciated you bringing this to the table for people to look at some of the science behind the claims. I mean, this is, this is good information. Now, as far as Fukushima goes, I am under the impression that whether or not there is a real earthquake that happened naturally or because of this dark star like you refer to. A lot of people would speculate there was more involved like explosions that went off, et cetera, but that could be a, a whole other episode. But what I'm wondering is with, all, with this thing being kind of like a, a black hole in essence and the numbers that you put together with this, is there any truth to the 3,600-year orbit? <clears throat> well, if you take the time between Noah and Moses and the time to today, and then the time from now to the end of the age, there is a period that lasts a little more than 3,000 years. So whether it's exactly 3,600 years, whether Sitchin's work is right or not, really doesn't matter to me. There, there is something that comes that has come before. There is historical precedent for it. 
and there's scriptural evidence for it. The earth is supposed to shake like a drunkard. The sun is supposed to turn dark. Have you noticed the coronal holes on the sun are getting bigger and bigger? Well, I de Rex and I definitely noticed that there are definitely radiational radiation changes. The sun's rays are different. If the intensity of them is, is higher, I mean, again, I, I can only speak for most of the time that I'm living in Southern California, but Rex measures the radiation, the solar radiation, and it's gone up, right? Rex, yeah. past, it's like dramatically it's gone up. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm looking at the levels right now and they're lower than they usually are. Right now it's at 0 0.09, but typically it's been hanging out over 0.1 up to 0.14 microsieverts per hour. And although that doesn't sound like it's high and it's not, the typical levels when I first picked this watch up back in 2013, and it's been recalibrated since, the levels were literally at 0 0.06, 0 0.07. They didn't, they rarely spiked, rarely went above that. And now I haven't seen it that low more than a couple of times in this area over the past couple of years. Now, traveling the country extensively for a couple of years from 2013 to 2015, I noticed certain states had much higher levels. Even if you go to southern Texas, like around Big Bend National Park in the park itself, the levels almost triple. Atlanta, they were really high. But it, you can definitely tell a difference with the actual radiation, and I'm wondering if it's because of all the geoengineering that's going on or if it is this dark star, if that's emitting extra radiation as well. Well, well, well before, before you answer that, is, okay. it, is it the geoengineering, great question, Rex, is it the geoengineering because of this? First, let's, let, let's get to that second. First, okay. you're, you're not measuring solar output whenever you're using your device. You're measuring Earth's ability to defend itself against solar radiation. So you're, you have solar output, which is diminishing. The solar output is actually weaker now. The heliosphere around our solar system has shrunk 25% in 10 years. The problem is, Earth magnetosphere is weakening 10 times faster than they previously thought. So what you're seeing is Earth magnetosphere fluctuating, and that is letting more of the solar rays get in, but the solar rays are actually weaker now, and they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So they're both getting weak. You're measuring what is coming through the magnetosphere that is fluctuating. Well, then, so what, do you, what does that mean, then? Yeah. What, what it means, well, you're not going to get a real accurate, you're not going to measure solar output using your device. You're going to measure what's come through the magnetosphere. So you're measuring a magnetosphere integrity in your area, and it's fluctuating over our heads all the time. So it's that, that value is going to fluctuate. But the sun is going to continue reducing activity. Your, your X-ray flux, your radio flux values are one-third what they should be, when anywhere near solar maximum. That happened in 2011 at the end. They expected solar cycle 24 to be bigger than 23. But then, and it was moving up just like it was going to in 2011. But then it flatlined in 2011 and the output values dropped to one third of what they were for the previous cycle. So the sun is going to sleep is what it is. And there's plenty of information on the internet about how the sun is going to sleep. That's why it has this blank of sunspots right now as we're talking. So, so whenever you're going to get your highest uh, readings, if you were outside the atmosphere, then that would be during solar maximum whenever you see all the sunspots and the sun is getting ready to switch poles. Let me jump in just real quick if I can, Terrell. What would you say then is causing the increase in radiation? Because this is a consistent level. I mean, it's a, it's a military grade Geiger counter. I, I don't know exactly all the different types of radiation that it picks up, but everybody right. that I talk to just about that I've asked this question can definitely tell a difference in the feeling of the sun when it hits their skin. I mean, just, yeah, just go sure. outside. I love the sun, man. I mean, if you give me a, a rock to lay on outside, it's like a hot rock. I'll be like a lizard there for a minute. It's, it, you know, right. I can enjoy it, but it's so intense now. I don't even really like being out in the sun right. for that long. So well, what's caused the increase in your opinion? Well, part of what you're getting in California is likely has to do. I, I'm not in California. Do. Oh, you're not? No, I'm in Texas. San Antonio, okay. Texas. Well, well I, I agree. I feel the same. San Antonio. The winds blow, and there's a lot of radiation out there. So if you're measuring with a Geiger counter, then what's, what, what's been in the oceans from Fukushima and what's in the clouds that's coming from that direction, from the prevailing winds, it's likely that you're getting some of that. And that is going to want to pool up in places when it rains, then it comes down the creek bed, then it's going to want to build up in certain areas. So if you get close to those funnel areas, places where that water passes through, then you're probably going to get higher readings than if you move away. So, so what you're saying then, Terrell, and I don't mean to cut you off, Rex, if you're going to say something, um, is no, if, you're, if, you're in, if you're in Southern California like I am, and I'm a good 30, you know, between 20, I, I guess 30 miles or so from the beach, um, I would be feeling uh, through the bari barometric pressure, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the offshore winds and, 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 and trowel or whatever it's called, I can't, the, uh, the inversion layer, um, I would be feeling so, somewhat some of the radiation from Fukushima. I'd say that's very possible, but the, the life on the, the slower in the food chain, the reptiles, the amphibians, they're going to be affected first. 
and the, re the reproductive cycles where it's going to show up, so in the embryos. So you're going to see those things way before it's going to affect you. It would affect your offspring, your, your uh, fertilized egg and your wife, before it's ever going to affect you. So we're too old to be affected by the amount of radiation that we're going to get from something like that. So if you're measuring, I mean, if you're looking up at the sun and it feels hotter, then there's a lot of variables involved there too, from humidity to the time of the day, the angle of the sun. So you kind of lost me there. I thought you were measuring yeah. actual the solar uh, rays rather than using a Geiger counter and getting radiation. Well, you know, I think it's more along the lines of the atmosphere itself is probably affected by all these chemical trails and what you're feeling on your skin because it does feel more intense. It does feel more like you're being radiated versus just heat. It doesn't really feel hotter. It just feels more intense on the skin and that's the overall phenomenon. So it's got to have something to do with the atmosphere, I would think, or essentially if it's this binary star that you're talking about, even though it's a, a dead star, essentially, I wonder if there's some type of radiation as well that it emits in conjunction with our own sun. Well back, well, back to your first question, Rex. I want Terrell to answer that. So, so back to the geoengineering, obviously he's insinuating it right now. Is that being done by the elites to prevent us from seeing this in, inbound body or, or is there a bigger picture to it? There's a bigger picture to it because, okay. because you can't see it. Right, you, you can't see it. A well-qualified a well astronomer with an observatory class telescope with infrared equipment and we're, we know where it is and we know we can't see it. What they're doing, you're talking about Rothschild Gates, you're talking about Rothschild Rockefeller Gates eugenics is what you're talking about. And uh, what they're spraying you with is uh, nanotechnology. Right, right. They're using talks about that. They're nano freaking nanogoblins. They're nanoparticulates, right. Right. Well, they're actually components. They can't spray you with an actual nanobot, but they, they spray you with the components. Then you breathe, you breathe them. Many of them get, are going to get on your skin, but your skin is a natural defense against anything like that. You shed your skin way quicker than any of these little guys can do anything. And you're only dealing with components anyway. But the, what happens is, it was explained to me by uh, Billy Hayes, who was one of my uh, lead researchers in Terrace Research Group for a long time. He built 200 of the heart facilities around the world. He's, he knows all this stuff. He educated me on it. These, these components, you breathe them in, and then you regurgitate them. And you know, it's, uh, your lungs don't like them. It's just like dust or anything else. It comes up, but then you swallow it. Whenever you swallow it, it goes into your stomach and hits the acid-rich environment. That's whenever the crystallization begins. These things grow to predetermined diameter and then on the corners of these crystals that's where they grows the these appendages these the uh, legs for mobility and antennae for communication and then you that's where the heart that's where heart comes in because the heart the carrier wave which is now space-based the old analog system was done away with in 2013 now it's all digi digitized and it's all space-based they're maintaining a carrier wave around our planet so that artificial intelligence can multi-frequency on top of that wave and it's like broadband so he's creating many other frequencies, and he's communicating with the nanos in your body. That's what the spraying is about, and they're wanting to upgrade it. The, what the scientists have been doing is trying to break the five nanometer barrier so that artificial intelligence can tell the nanos in your body to reassemble amino acids to viruses. If you remember the H1N1 scare, this was a super-duper biological weapon. The problem was two missing amino acids. That's all they had to do was reconnect, and they had a super strain. That was a dry run for what's coming in the future. When the elite fail-safe plan is initiated, there's going to be a contagion, and it's going to be artificial intelligence assisted. And they need these nanobots to be inside of you in order to make the stuff work. So that this is uh, the way that the House of Rothschild is controlling everything, every single so, thing. So, so all of that makes sense. I mean, this is you're, you're, this is disturbing stuff, but it makes sense to me. I think Rex would somewhat agree. I mean, you know, him and I are big anti-vaccine and anti, you know, nanos and all of the nonsense that's going on. But you will not disseminate me. If, if the dark star, you know, is going to destroy 80, 90% of the population, then why, why do they need that? That's a, that's a fail safe that it, if it doesn't, or I mean, what is their end game with that? No, their end game is control. They cannot allow the sleepers that are all around them to wake up to what's happening because that'll start a civil war. They're not going to be able to run to the underground arc cities. So this is a mechanism. This is a device that they use to control the masses right now. So what they have in Denver, Remember that the New York Charter of the Council on Foreign Relations opened up their charter in Denver in 1938. That's how long they've been preparing the underground Arc City program that's there, the underground bunker positions that are there. And that's why the FBI, the CIA moved their headquarters there in 2005 because now they're working with the Council on Foreign Relations working groups. These working groups are the ones that are running these real-world simulations. There's a radio show happening right now. We're in their simulation. Right. The way that they connect, the way they get the impulse the input data to feed their real-world host is through HARP. It's through 
artificial intelligence, communicating with the nanos in your body so that it can transmit and give input to the real world host. They have a, a uh, main program and then they create duplicates of that in order to identify threats. They're gonna change one thing in millions of simulations. Artificial intelligence does this very rapidly and they identify the threats. That's why so many of these, as, uh, these astronomers, uh, read Stu Noodle's Dead Astronomer Report. He was one of my key researchers. That's why, they're, that's why they're being killed because they're in dark star imaging. And if one of these researchers devises a way to see the black star, it's gonna ruin the underground Arc City program. So they're killed. Before they ever, they ever invent the thing, they invented the thing in a simulation already. AI identified them as a threat and he killed them in the past. AI is always working in the future. You so, wait a minute. So, did you, did you, correct me if I'm wrong, did you, have you had researchers working for you that have been killed? Yes. Jesus. Okay. Michael Owens, my chief astronomer, most brilliant man I ever met, he had to be, he had, he had to be taken out of the way because he knew the guy was a genius, brilliant man. He took over my desktop and with a new NASA program and showed me all the asteroids, all the uh, meteors coming out of the Leo constellation back in 2011. He was a very gifted man and he uh, went to the hospital, not only him, Stu Noodle, a group went in uh, March of 2012 and another group went in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in the next month in April, Stu Noodle went with the second group. My mother went to the hospital the same day as Michael Owens. 13 other members of my research group, 350 members I had in my research group. Uh, many of the administrators, they were found unconscious. They were taken to the hospital, just like my mother was, just like Michael Owens was. Their lungs filled with fluid, and then their heart starts, they start having heart attacks. And we're talking about people having heart attacks that are 25 years old, members of my research group. Stu Noodle was only 34 years old, and he went to the hospital. He was there seven weeks, lungs filling with fluid, multiple heart attacks. And the people that lived have stents in their hearts. My sister-in-law had a stent put in her heart, totally clean system. She doesn't have any plaque whatsoever. Two nodes were growing in a major artery inside of her heart, causing her to have to have a stent. My mother died, my cousin died, and my other cousin died within two weeks in March 2013. They died on the next cycle. So there's that information. A lot of that information is in the Dropbox folder. I don't talk about it a whole lot because the more you know, the more chances that you're going to become a threat to artificial intelligence. That's one of the, I was doing seven radio shows a week. I was reaching over a million people per month and that's whenever the problem started. So that's why I've been doing one radio show and doing things slowly and trying not to get ahead of the pace of the elite. Once we get beyond their fail safe, they won't care. But until then, their worst, their worst fear is that the military contingent, the lettered agencies, people working in our government, that they're gonna wake up and then want their place in the underground arc city and there's not enough room for everybody. Civil war, that ruins the elite plan. So. This is the way that they do it. That's what HARP is. It's a means so that they can control everything. Um, the thing that you were asking me about is the geoengineering, like, like the skater square technology and things like that. They're using that to make the earth look more normal. If they weren't using these devices, weather modification devices, then it would become more apparent what's going on. So they're trying to nudge things to make them look like a re regular weather pattern whenever what's happening to the earth right now is anything but regular. You have jet stream fluctuation that is wild, right. and you have the air masses now mixing from the northern and southern hemispheres, which is wild. Right. That was caused by ocean conveyor disruption. The northern ice sheets depleted very rapidly because of the, the large magnetite deposits under the North Pole. The, uh, the black star is taking the sun's electromagnetism and it's redirecting it through a secondary set of magnetic portal connections. The earth is absorbing that electromagnetism and it's being translated into heat through induction, the induction process like a new wave cooker. So the metals and the salts are what's causing the earth to heat up. The northern ice sheets depleted, that reduced the polar drip. You have not enough polar drip, and then the ocean conveyor breaks. That's already happened. Then the, the jet stream starts fluctuating. That's already happened. So these dominoes are, are falling. The elite are trying to prop them up, like they're propping up silver using the back door of the Fed, the, the, the uh, short position of J.P. Morgan. They're, it's very similar. They're trying to make your money look like it's worth something so you don't wake up. They're trying to keep gas around $2 a gallon. They're trying to manipulate everything to make sure that everybody thinks it's cool, and so they don't wake up. They're thinking peace and safety. So, so when, so with all of that, so when you know you mentioned the failsafe, when they don't care anymore, when is that? My best, because it's a guess. If I, it, because that's what I do is threat assessment, contingency planning for people. If I was advising them, it'd be sixty to ninety days before the event, and that we know that event's going to happen in May. And we know the black stars move left in the orbit diagram, an average of twelve degrees per year for a decade. Last year, it only moved three. 
the, the reason is because the relationship it has with the black star, between the black star and the sun, they have mismatched magnetic polarity so that the black star is actually slowing down as it's coming to perihelion position, which is crazy. And I only found out about it from reading the research of a Canadian student, not from NASA, and he, it was observed two stars coming together and the smaller one was slowing down because the magnetic, the binary star magnetic repulsion. So that's what we have as a, as a star. It's not a planet, it's a star. And it is being repelled by the sun at the same time that it's, as it's being drawn in by the gravity. The deal is the gravity force pulling it in multiplies it, it uh, by two by, uh, by, with the, the square of the closing distance, the square of the closing distance. The magnetic polarity strength, the repulsion force is increasing by the cube of the closing distance. It's actually greater than the cube because we're not dealing with static magnets here that have, have a certain force. We're dealing with the black star that's siphoning energy from the sun and becoming more powerful. So it's actually growing. That repulsion. That's like the fifth element. It's coming in, and it, the black star magnetic polarity strength is growing while the sun's magnetic polarity strength is weakening. So it's actually growing by more than the cube of the closing distance. So what's happening is when it's far away and it's coming in, it's on an elliptical orbit, but it's transitioning. We caught it in 2000, between 2015 and 2016 transitioning to something that's more circular. And it's going to reach perihelion near, near Venus orbit path when it does. That's, and it's done this before. That's why Venus is screwed up. Venus is, has a reverse rotation. It's the, only, it's the planet in the inner solar system that rotates backwards from everyone, all the others. Daryl, can I jump in real quick about Venus? Sure. Because I was actually going to ask that question, then I started thinking about something else. And I remember in 2011, I read multiple articles and blog posts about how Venus, it flipped or something weird was going on. And I just went and did a bunch of research just now, and I tried to find that same article, and I couldn't find it. So is there any truth to that? Um, not that it flipped. The story that I saw, I think in 2012, was that Venus's rotation is slowing, and they couldn't figure out why. Like they couldn't figure out the Saturn dust storms 30 years apart when it was passing through Leo. Like the mystery Martian dust storms, Jupiter's liquefying core. These are things that the scientists, the shrinking heliosphere, has a mystified. Reversing magnetosphere in our Earth. That's where my, my investigation picks up when we see the anomaly, when we see what's baffling the scientists, the things that they can't explain. And then when we do the research, we track it backwards and we realize it's because of black star influence. That's what we're talking about. So it's not that Venus has flipped or anything. It's been messed with many times because the perihelion position of the black star, the perihelion is whenever this object is nearest the sun before it heads back out. It, when it, when it, it, it's moving to that circular orbit and it's going to come around at Venus orbit path very close to it. So Venus might be rotating differently when the black star leaves this time than it is right now. So Terrell, let, let me link this to current modern day events right now. I mean, you know, Brex and I talking, pre, you know, in the last day or so off the record. I mean, we've never seen so much craziness going on right now in the, in the geopolitical structure of the world, you know, obviously with the insanity of the U.S. election. So I, I want to see that to, I guess, the elite, the elite strategy. Um, if they've known about it since 1938, you know, they've moved everything to, um, you know, Denver and uh, obviously other uh, dumb, you know, deep underground military under, underground bases or installations somewhere in, this, in the Midwest, in the mountains, mountainous regions, I would assume. At what point do they start to leave and bug out? 60 to 90 days. From before. now? No, no, no. Before the event. Before May. And you're, so you're saying the event is May? We know the month because of the... It's not the year. We, the slow move, it, it was predicted for May the 20th, 2017, according to the old modeling, because it's moved for a decade, 12 degrees left in the orbit diagram. So as this thing was coming in, it was slowing down to make it appear as this thing had a circular orbit, which is impossible. It created a 188-day cycle. Saturn has a natural 189-day cycle. A lot of people thought it was Saturn because of that, but it created a 188-day cycle because of that relationship. So it was figured for May 20th, 2017. My prediction for last year was for May the 7th, and it came early on April the 28th. That's only three days after April the 25th of the previous year, the 7.8 Nepal quake. A three-degree move was not projected by any of the modeling. So now we're sitting here wondering, are we going to have another three-degree move this year? Is it going to be another 12-degree move? What's it going to do? The Earth has to testify. As we come to outside orbit position, then I got new data. That was happened August the 19th. Everything happened too early. Now we're going to come behind the sun relative to the black star. And I've got a lot of data that I'm going to gather as we're coming behind. We're going to watch the solar flare activity. We're above the plane, so I, I'm not – and it's below the plane, so we're, I may not get my three solar flares leading up to my backside alignment quake event. The quake event last year was two, the two 7.6 Peru quakes, November 24th, 2015. That happened when the Earth passed behind the sun relative to the black star. Is it going to be three days later this year, and it's going to match the front side alignment? See, these are things that I don't know yet, but the Earth will tell us. Then, 
after this, this rash of earthquakes and volcanism we're going to have in the second two weeks of November, it's going to happen. We're going to go to outside orbit position again three months later. And I'm going to look at, be able to look at all the seismic values. That's going to tell me how far left in the orbit diagram this guy went. Now, whenever it gets to the left side of Libra, my old modeling said it's here. So this thing is transitioning in its modeling, but I think everything is going to equal out by the time it gets to Earth orbit path. So there's no way that it can go beyond uh, into June or July because then its orbit path would make it so far out that it would miss Earth altogether. There would, there's no possibility for a crossing event. And that, that's what Nibiru means, planet of crossing. So it's May the 20th. It's going to be in the month of May. Pretty darn sure that, but I, I know enough to know that I don't know what year it is. Well, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume if we're going to have this kind of massive earthquake? I guess maybe not. I mean, I guess I'm just thinking about for myself because of where I live. But So this type of earthquake activity that's going to happen in the second two weeks of November. I mean, would this type, if it's as big as you say it is, where the, you know it's crustal movements, splitting, whatever, um, I mean, that's going to dis, disrupt. It's going to bring on societal chaos, right, in North America at least. That's right. But that's not what I'm predicting for this orbit cycle. See, the, we're watching the magma waves that are, that are pressurized from the transition zone of Earth's mantle, these rising magma plumes, and volume 28 of my newsletter, I do a lot of work on it, and I did a little work on it on this newsletter today. We can actually see the scientists did give us an image inside of the Earth of these rising magma plumes. That's gonna be what destroys the western part of the United States before it shifts east. So we're gonna, we know the seismic pattern, we know that these deep earthquakes we're seeing in Fiji right now, down in the transition zone, last week they jumped over into South America, just like those Two Peruvian quakes, they were 600, more than 600 kilometers deep in, under South America. They jumped over from Indonesia. Those earthquake events are going to continue migrating north. We're going to see how far north. But I expect to see the deep earthquakes going through Central America and Mexico before they get to California. So you're going to have plenty of warning for something like that. So when you, but when you say, like, what kind of white? Are we talking, like, over an 8.5 where it's like the movie, you know, earthquake, the movie that was out last year where the entire state was just separated? Or are we talking just, I guess... Talking about those kind of earthquakes. We're talking about earthquakes that take place 600 kilometers deep inside the earth. Right. So you're, it's not like you're going to feel the earth shaking. It has nothing to do with Earth's crust. It has right. to do with the transitions on of Earth's mantle. So out there in Fiji where they're having, or even over in the South America when they had this big 7.6s, they were deep, deep down in the earth. That causes that magma to rise. It displaces. As that magma is rising, then it becomes, it, it's like an air bubble on the bottom of the ocean. As it rises, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It displaces the heavier magma that is supporting the crust. Whenever the, all them bubbles from all that, the, the magma from the transition zone is glassy-like. Rock on top of the transition zone, metal on the bottom. This is the glass that's in the middle. The, whenever Yellowstone erupted the last time, it killed animals on the other side of the planet because it came from the transition zone of the mantle. So I saw a report today that says that earthquakes can happen in California further than 15 miles deep. They can happen 600 kilometers deep. Right, right. They've been reporting that actually recently about right. that. So they're kind of prepping this. But what, again, for, for the lay person, and, and, and we're on live on Facebook right now, so there's a lot of people watching like, and listening, and, and definitely they're listening. Um, what does that mean? Like, are we talking a giant tsunami? Are we talking uh, you know, magma coming up through the streets? I mean, what are we talking about? All the above. Talking about massive See, California is in the worst position in the whole world because the magma that originating, these plumes originate in Indonesia. They're pushing up through the Philippines. They're pushing up through Japan. We had a new volcanic eruption this week in Japan and Kamchatka. This magma wave is deep in the earth, and it's coming around. It, create, it has horns on it that push up, little domes that push up. That's what's creating these five magnitude earthquakes off the coast of Central America and Mexico right now. We're having a series of them. I predicted them in advance. I know where the magma plumes are, and it's happening. Now, we are going to be in an uptick period until the end of November. The Earth core is going to continue getting hotter and hotter until the end of November, and then we're going to go through a lull period. The Earth core is going to cool down again. So the question is, how far are these magma waves going to push before they start retreating back towards Indonesia? So we still have until all the way until the end of November, and uh, we, I'm already seeing the five magnitude earthquakes off of the coast of South, of, uh, South America, Central America, Mexico, out in the Pacific. That's from these magma plumes that are deep in the earth, and they're, they're wanting to rise up. They're pushing magma already, and it's causing these five magnitude earthquakes. Those are warning signs that I'm giving you right there. So, you're, so what, you're, what you're saying essentially is that the likelihood of, a, of, of an ELE for the western, western United States is extremely high. Extremely high. These magma waves are pushing through Chile. They're pushing through Kamchatka. But whenever they converge, at the, the coming around the Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire, they're going to push through Cascadia. They're going to come from the south, and they're going to converge at the California Quake Swarm area. And when that happens, the two waves are going to make a mountainous wave, and that is going to cause the destruction. 
that we're that that I'm talking about. I've been warning about this for a couple of years, and uh, there's a lot of science. The the resets, the tectonic volcanic resets that have taken place going back to 2004 with the 9.3 um, um, Sumatra quake, the big the one that made the big uh, tsunami that killed a lot of people. That's an event on the Black Star timeline. Then uh, another big event was Solomon Island that cracked the tectonic plate in two, multiple eight magnitude earthquakes, and that took place February 6, 2013. Shortly after that, you started having the plus three um, magnitude earthquake jump in at the Oklahoma quake swarm area. In 2013 is when it happened. 2014, that's whenever the Russians came out with the Grim Report. Make sure you read it. The Grim Report coming out from the Russians. It's this, the magnetic anomalies that they see over the United States now is caused by the separation of the tectonic plates. Whenever you had the break of the tectonic plate, Solomon Islands, it caused the start of a tectonic cascade. These plates in California, they are pushed up against the North American Craton. The North American Craton is 250 kilometers deep, very stable. Where you are sitting, the, the, the crust, Earth crust is only 60 kilometers deep. All these plates are pushed up against it, and everything has been safe until Solomon Island. That was a domino that fell against California because if you notice, there's a new line of earthquakes from Texas up through Seattle that's pointing at Cascadia. Now, Yellowstone is part of the, the California quake swarm area. When I started this investigation, it was a Baja California quake swarm area. Now it's pr proliferated all the way up through Canada. It's getting bigger and it's getting bigger because of the tectonic reset that took place. We know that it was a reset because my indicator quakes, the 2.54 magnitude, two weeks after that event dropped down to just 107 globally. That hasn't happened before and it hasn't happened since then. Another big event, the 8.3 Chile quake, 2015, happened in week 34. Whenever that happened, we had six, six mag we had 12 six magnitude earthquakes that were associated with it. After that event, for five weeks, we did not have a six magnitude earthquake in the entire world. Five weeks. That was the tectonic reset. The pressures that have been building up in the Pacific Ocean Ring of Fire are now jumping through South America to the Atlantic Ocean. So we know that what the pattern is. We start having the activity along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge at the very end of the Earth change uptake periods. We've already seen that in this uptake period whenever we had two months to go still. So there's a gigantic change in the entire globe with this, the seismicity and with the volcanism. Now the earthquakes and the volcanism are becoming more connected than they were previous to Solomon Island. So the warning signs are everywhere. And these waves are going to continue building. Like dominoes falling, they're going to converge at California. That is going to happen later in the timeline. But like I said, I'm on the case. We're watching this magma plume activity, and we're making predictions about where we're going to get these five magnitude earthquakes, and it's coming true. But if you open up your earthquake 3D and look off the coast of uh, Mexico, south of your position, you're going to see a lot of fives out there in the Pacific Ocean. That's that magma wave coming in your direction. So I would be... So when, should, when should I leave, Terrell? So when should I take my family and get the F out of California? At what point and how far east do I need to go? Is Nevada and Arizona also at risk? There is no safe zone west of the Rocky Mountain Ridge in the United States. There's not one there. The reason is because all of those calderas, there's lots of calderas out there. They're going to be pressurized from the bottom. They're going to be filled with that glassy type magma. It's going to displace the heavier magma. Everything's going to bulge like Jiffy Pop popcorn, and then it's going to collapse. As soon as you have an eruption, it's going to collapse. That's what creates the big hole out there. So, so if any of those blow, and Yellowstone is obviously in the, in the danger zone, I mean, what are we talking about, though, from an impact for, like, North America alone? I mean, is nobody safe, right? I mean, it can extinguish population and block out the sun for months, right? The only thing going to put that fire out is the Pacific Ocean. And the safest place to be in the United States is in the Ozarks. Just like John Moore says, just like the, the Navy intelligence people, the Navy, because I'm from a Navy family, Navy intelligence knows what's happening, but the Navy does not know what's happening out there. The guys that know are, that's why I moved to the Ozarks and worked there for two years, because I know this stuff's coming. So I went there and worked without pay on a large uh, land. You could walk around this land for days with a big giant cavern and brought my survival group there. And survival groups are forming right now, not at that position, but at a nearby location, then it's the safest place to be. You're far enough south to avoid the pyroclastic flows. You've got protection from the Rocky Mountain Range, and the, the prevailing winds are going to take it north of our position. The power plants that are on the, the North American Craton are going to be decommissioned. The elite are going to get their power from there later in the timeline. There's no comparison to a nuclear power plant on the North American Craton and one that is on the East Coast, where you have thin crust, and you're going to have crustal displacement later in the timeline. There's, there's also no safe zone east of the Mississippi River Basin for that reason. Just imagine whenever after Yellowstone goes, New Madrid's going to pop, you're going to have a new line of earthquakes running from Louisiana all the way up to the Great Lakes. It's going to liquefy the entire region, liquef 
the liquefaction is going to create the inland gulf. Everything is going to flow right out into the Gulf of Mexico, and the salt water is going to run all the way up to the Great Lakes. That's the scenario that we're talking about. And then, problem is, these, these, uh, you know the stories of Pangaea? There was one continent. Yeah. Well, the, the, the edges went away from each other, and they came together on the other side of the planet. Guess where that is? Central United States. So you have got a fault line that is on the eastern that's on the eastern side of the ridge of the Appalachian Mountains that are, that's pushed together like fists. Whenever New Madrid goes, then you're going to get a settling from the ridge that's going to want to move west, and it's going to open up this crack, and you have a fault that's running from North Carolina all the way up to New England that's going to shake just like the New Madrid. There's no safe zone over there. You can't go in a cavern and come out later because of all the nuclear power plants that are, and the revealing winds are over there. So my group, that we went to the Ozarks, and we have people from California and New York and North Carolina, all over the country. It's in the central part of the country. That has, has been identified as the safest place in the northern hemisphere for lots and lots of reasons. Natural water resources that come from the aquifers and uh, cavern formations where the animals can, can avoid, so that can become our food source. And uh, it's remote area. We're 45 minutes from a paved road, for example. And uh, so it's the perfect survival location. And that's where you're going to want to look. If I were you, I would take a vacation, go to the Ozarks, visit caverns, shake hands with those people and um, and then make that my place that I'm going to bug out to. You don't have to move. You have to have a bug out location, a place that you're going to go whenever your threat assessment guy tells you when to go. You're a newsletter subscriber. You subscribe to my newsletter, so you're going to get the notice that you need to bail. You need to get the heck out of there because when I'm making my move, you guys are all going to know. So real quick for uh, everybody that's watching because we got a lot of people watching, um, how, how can people subscribe to your newsletter? And by the way, I subscribe to his newsletter um, you know, not blowing smoke. He's, he's not trying to collect money from people. It's dirt cheap and he gives it to you for the whole year. How much is it? Uh, Terrell, how do they do it? $25 per year. And you go to this website right here. There's my name, Terrell 03.com. R R A L zero three.com. I see yeah. he's got amazing information. He's got a book on nine 11 too, that I've been skimming through. That's absolutely fantastic. So, you know. yeah, there's a lot of free stuff here. This is the scripture section. This is the two hour radio show on that. It's uh, all introductory to the mystery explained the book I wrote. It's a pig and it, you want to see God's wisdom? It's hidden in plain sight through his three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water. That's where, you, that's where you're going to want to go. If you're a God-fearing, gospel-believing Christian, you don't have to prepare for anything. Right. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it's told that we're caught away. The destruction that I'm talking about comes in 1 Thessalonians 5. It comes afterward. So that's the section for, like, if you're elderly, if you are dependent on medications to live, go to the scripture section. Then this is the 9-11 section right here. And it's same format, six videos, and then a two-hour radio show and a book here. And same thing here, six videos to our radio show and then my newsletter. And you get 52 newsletters. You actually get access to all the newsletters. that are very, I recommend volume number nine from 2012. Michael Owens wrote it, the gifted guy. He was the one that was writing all the featured articles back then. And um, so you just hit the subscription button, and it's a PayPal thing. If you don't want to use PayPal because you don't like PayPal or whatever, you can click this contact Terrell button and write me, and I will give you a snail mail address. You can send a check, $25 per year and you get a ton of benefits from that. You, you get the special Gmail account that you write and then you ask me your questions and pretty prompt, usually by the next morning, then you have your answer. And then I can include that in the weekly newsletters to help other people. To, uh, I think you have some questions, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just some great information. You know, I was talking about synchronicities earlier and there's actually a group that got in touch with me from the Ozarks and they said, hey, we've got this homestead program we're doing out here. It's extremely cheap. We're helping people get set up for virtually next to nothing. And I think that's fantastic. I've been through Missouri and many times. I mean, I love it out there. And it just seems like people assume that aren't from Missouri or Texas, that Texas is like the number one place for patriotism, essentially. And I'm sure many pockets are, but in San Antonio, it's a, it's a real melting pot. And there's a lot of great people out here. But if you go to Missouri, I mean, I'm talking about patriotism out there. People just really appreciate the American freedoms and, and just a lot of you, you see that, you sense that, you go to Branson, there's a lot of military people out there, and the Mark Twain forest is beautiful, it's a great place to be, so that's fantastic. And the question I was going to ask is, back in two, this is going to divert the topic here, but I think this is so important, especially because of what you were talking about just a minute ago, and most people aren't real informed with the nanotech that's involved with a lot of these chemtrails or chemicals that are being sprayed in the atmosphere, and who knows where else they're being put. Definitely, there's possibilities. Some people have said the vaccines and medicines. Who knows if they're putting in organic food? I mean, they very well could be because so many corporations control so much, but you said that you had a friend that actually helped build these harp-like facilities around the world, correct? 
200 of them, yes. Billy Hayes. Okay. So I had an opportunity to go to Alaska in 2013. And speaking of radiation levels, when I was up in the plane, it went all the way up to 4.2, which was just the high 4.2 microsieverts per hour from 0 0.07 essentially when I was on the ground. So just think about that for a minute. But anyway, uh, I made a phone call to my friends before I went out there and I talked to somebody on a chat line about how I was going to go to Alaska and check out the HARP facilities. And I was just kind of joking around when I said it, but I was definitely thinking about it. I wanted to get out there and look at it, but I didn't say I was going to do anything conspicuous. I just wanted to go out and check it out. So I go to Alaska. I spent a month out there with work and I had a chance to kind of get outside of Anchorage, not anywhere close to the HARP facilities, but I'm with my friends and coworkers. We're, we're driving. We stop at this, uh, this park, essentially. It's a, it's a national park. I don't even know if it was a national park, but there was um, a whole bunch of salmon that were coming in because it was salmon season, essentially. And there were these two homeless people we saw sitting outside of this park. And I, we, were th we started talking. We're like, you know, they should, they're probably going to wait for people to leave at nighttime and go get all the salmon that are there because there were just so many salmon coming in. And I said, no, that's a bad idea because there's those cameras right there. You see that? And they said, yeah. So we, we see them. We think they're homeless. We get back in the vehicle. We take off, you know, 45 minutes down the road. And then there's a gas station we stop at to, to grab some drinks, get some fuel. And uh, my, my friend that I was with, coworker, he goes, hey, you see those guys right there? Weren't those the homeless people that were across the street at the park that we were just talking about? I said, yeah, that's them. So essentially, they, just because I said I was going to check out Harp on some chat uh, internet thing, I think it was uh, Godlike Produ Productions Forum at the time, I got followed around out there at that one, at that one point like they were just waiting to see if I was going to go check out that facility. So that's, that's pretty intense, man. And as far as the AI tech you're talking about, I've speculated about this for years. I've blogged about it, but I haven't really had any super solid evidence to back it up, just little bits and pieces and putting things together, more of a theory, essentially a hypothesis, like there's a, a Sims virtual reality that plays us and threat matrices, et cetera. With that being said, I'm starting to wonder, does the AI control the people? Or do people control the AI? I mean, just look at Skynet in the movie. Skynet is real. There's satellites around the world that have been there since the 50s called Skynet that do certain spy type programs. Are we literally in the matrix living out some type of virtual reality program? Could that explain quantum physics? Could that explain how DNA breaks down into quad code? Could that explain how there's sacred geometry and everything? Is this the key to the possibilities? And this is, is this why people like Elon Musk and others say we want to break out of the matrix? We're living in this virtual reality system and it's time to break free. We, we talked a little bit before the show about the um, real-world simulations. I think I'll give you a little bit of information on that. Their ultimate goal is to reverse the feed. See, they're, they're gathering impulse input data from you to feed your real-world host in the simulation. Now, the goal is to reverse that so that the, the real-world host inside is controlling you. So that's what their goal is, is to be able to control. This is about manipulation and control, and just so they can get to the underground arc cities. Because, like you said, the black star is going to kill everybody. Okay, so, so, so we are living in a matrix right now. You are connected to a host that's in a matrix right now. The question is, have you been uh, reverse fed yet? Is that why people are walking around us like zombies? Like they don't know what's going on? Because a percentage of the population, according to Billy, cannot be controlled by HARP. A percentage of the population, uh, Morgellons disease is a uh, side effect of rejecting the, uh, the, the uh, technology, the nanotechnology, the filaments. They could grow right out of your skin. And there is a way to neutralize uh, their ability. It's the nanofilament replication inhibitor. And if you just Google my, make sure you go to my YouTube channel and Google it. I mean, and, uh, and subscribe. And then Google, uh, you, you can find my video on the nanofilament. What you're talking about is the boron molecule. Boron is an extremely efficient little guy. It's a miracle drug. 24 health benefits from just taking a pinch, three, three pinches a day. And you're just your regular drinking water, but don't put anything in your body because of me. I'm not a doctor, I'm a researcher. But my glass right beside me right now, right here, has got a pinch of sodium borate in it. Sodium borate, that's what you want to use. And that eats the legs off of the nanos that are in your body. It also is a natural antifungal. So if you have candida condition, which about three-quarters of the Americans have, then it's going to neutralize that too. It's going to raise your blood pH. It has a 9.3 pH. So um, I encourage you to go to borexcures.com and look at it, but also look at my video. And uh, a little bit of apple cider vinegar goes a long way. 18 health benefits from that. And um, just two tablespoons a day is all you need of that. So, but, um, so, so real, real quick, we got a bunch of questions, but I, I want to make sure that you finish with what you want to say. And also Rex, if he has anything he, he wants to add to, but we have some really good questions for you. Let me, let me just see this with, you know, you're talking about the elites and, and, and the fail safe and all that. So what, what related to current events right now are, is, 
you know, if we're having this massive earthquake and, 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 and complete chaos at the end of November, as you're calling it. Um, wait, wait, wait. No, this is like we had the 7.6s last year. It wasn't a massive event. We had a pair of 7.6s in Peru. You can read about it. But no, no, I'm, I'm not predicting saying. anything like that. We had a rash of earthquakes in April. But these magma waves have not matured yet. They're, they're not fully pressurized yet. I'm not expecting any crustal displacement until later in the timeline. Oh, so you're saying we're not, you're not, we're not going to have like ELE type stuff in the end of November. No, this is when the Earth passes behind the sun relative to the black star. I have to gather the data. There's going to be solar flaring that takes place with it. And there's other things that I'm looking for so I can build the predictive modeling. I have to have data to feed it. About California. You, you've completely lost me. I, I'm talking about California. You said that at the end of November, that's what you said, that we were going to have this issue, correct? Or am I that's when we pass behind the sun relative to the black star. We're going to have an earthquake event. It's likely going to be a seven magnitude. Last year it was a 7.6. It happened down in South America. I'm not saying that's going to happen in California. If I was to speculate, I would actually think that it's going to happen between Peru and Mexico. If I was going to speculate, because the last one took place down in Peru, I'm expecting it to move north. But it can happen over in Indonesia. It can be a Japan quake like Fukushima. Right. This is not going to be a global event. It's going to be a local event somewhere. The 2012 scenario that I'm describing for you takes place when the black star gets here. Right. That could be 2017. It could be 2018. It could be 2019. I don't know the year. I know the month. But you feel like with your research and everything that you guys are tracking, that you guys will have a good idea of being able to give people advance notice. Absolutely. Cool. Um, so, so do you think then, so, so, go, so back to the elites and I, Rex, I'm sure if you have something, interrupt me here, but back to the elites. Um, the, why is, what is the real reason that they don't want anybody to know? Is it just for the eugenics, just to reduce population? It's going to threaten their own survival. Whenever you know that the world's about to end, what are you going to do? They can't control you then. They, they can't in, in, ensure the safety of their families going to the underground arc cities. They have to keep it quiet. Just like the 2012 movie. The people with green cards, they know they're not telling a soul. The China people, will save you. No. That's what they show in 2012 at the end. I was being sarcastic there, but where are the arcs? In China. Right. Well, that's the friends, Hollywood spin, in my opinion. Hollywood's really pushing China as the new economic savior, the new world power. You know, we were talking about this uh, another episode, Jay, about how so many TV shows are doing the same thing. So not happening. China cannot even breathe. They're not smart enough to. Uh, what we should be doing is is uh, vapor plasma integrated engines. I know that's a little bit of a different topic, but vaporize the fuel, get 100% burn. You don't have a smog. It was invented by a Canadian back in 1930s. We should be getting 200 miles a gallon by vaporizing using a giant manifold on our engines. And we're not doing it. But China seems like they should be smart enough to figure out how to beat the, the pollution problem. There are people running around with masks on. So China has a lot of growing up to do before they're going to save the world, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just giving you Hollywood's impression. Right. So, Terrell, like, what are your thoughts on the current presidential election? Do you, is there any chance that Trump has a winning or it's, just, it's already completely rigged and Hillary's installed? And it doesn't matter who wins. The president of the United States is the chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations in Denver. Right. Okay. Let's just use Benghazi as an example. People know about it. The stand down order came from Denver. Obama was told to stand down. Hillary was told to stand down. General Ham, AFRICOM, was told to stand down because um, Stevens was a double agent and he was going to expose the gun running going to ISIS in Jordan. They, the CIA and the DOD were training ISIS in Jordan back in 2012 to fill the power vacuum created by Obama, but Obama doesn't do anything. He's a puppet. The guy doesn't have a brain in his head. He doesn't know what he's doing. The, the, what, the people that are doing it are the people, the, the House of Rothschild, the Council on Foreign Relations, that's on this side of the country, um, this side of the world, Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergs, the, their working groups, those are the people that run the show. Those people in Washington, it doesn't matter who's over there. It doesn't matter whatsoever. The problem that I have with Hillary is the fact that so many Americans are willing to accept somebody so corrupt right. as their I president. I don't think they are. I think that this, the, whole, the whole thing is rigged. I think that the media is making all of us, meaning everyone, assume that people are willing to accept the corruption. But I don't think they are. I think the whole thing is a trick, F-U-C-K. You know, I, I don't think anybody is willing to. I think that the people they interview for the sound bites that say they're in support of Hillary, I think it's all, it's all rigged. Like everything, it's all rigged. The media is in control of everything, like you said. Yeah, well, we'll see. Um, I, I would really rather see Trump. The pro big problem we have here is the uh, competition with the illegals, companies that hire strictly illegals. Our company had 350 people, and uh, it's out of business because we refuse to work the illegals. The prices kept going down and down and down and down below cost because you can hire three illegals for the price of one bricklayer, you know, American bricklayer. So um, that's the big problem we have here. 
And if he could fix some of that, which is not going to happen, it's part of the worker displacement agenda of the CFR. So you've got NAFTA type treaties, guest worker programs. They're going to bring 1.5 million foreigners into this country to take jobs that we don't even have. And they're going to do it every single year as part of the agenda. So the United States is done. That's why I'm a member of a survival group in the Ozarks. I think you guys should be too. So let me ask this you a question. Order. Rex, if, if, if you don't have anything, Rex, I'm going to ask questions from the group. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Sounds okay. good. Okay, so um, a lot of questions. I'm going to try to skim to the best ones here. Um, could a nuclear war have any impact on seismic levels of the Earth? A nuclear war have any effect on seismic levels? Yes, meaning what you're projecting from this inbound body. Could it throw, could it throw off your measurements? Um, just, I've never been asked that question before. Nuclear. <laughs> That's um, well, whenever you start blasting things with nukes, you have a lot more problem with fallout. And why would you want to do that? Well, I mean, obviously, they're threat right now. Russia and the United States are threatening them. No, they're not. They're friends. This is all good cop, bad cop thing. They're keeping you mesmerized watching them. They're getting ready to run the underground arc cities. They have to run sleeper operations. So they have to get their people that are not going to the underground cities. They have to get them oriented, trained for deployment. They're going to be deploying troops everywhere when the thing gets here because they want Americans on Russian soil, Russians on our soil. Because then, whenever it comes time, they're going to deploy the sleepers against us and we're going to neutralize one another. That's the plan. Also, there's going to be a peace treaty. And the only way they're going to have a peace treaty is if they bang the war drums, make everybody think that they're going to war. The, the Russians, the Americans, the elite, they have too much of a threat with the Black Star. They're not going to create more threats by blowing people up with nukes. That is not going to happen. They're going to put a, get up on the stage just like Trump and Hillary, and they're going to dance around and everything, and then they're going to decide, well, we better have peace. That's what's going to happen. It's all smokescreen. I encourage you to read the book, None Dare Call a Conspiracy by former Congressman Gary Allen. It came out in the 70s. I read it when I was a teenager. What's it called? What's it called? None, None Dare Call a Conspiracy by former Congressman Gary Allen. It's a very small book. Chapter 3 is The Money Manip Manipulators. It talks about the House of Rothschild, and it shows you who really runs. Things. A lot of people thought these, these things, not Black Star, but these, this collapse was going to happen back in the 70s. And uh, I think a lot of had, that had to do with uh, the Kissinger Agreement, the, uh, pet, the, the dollar, the denominating oil wealth in the Middle East to push. Remember the gas prices we had back then? Like the world was running out of gas. People were paying 3 and $4 a gallon back in the 70s because the, all this stuff was brought to a head until they got their, their uh, big agreement so that the, the uh, dollar was used to, for exchange around the globe. So um, I've got a little different view, what the Russians are doing, what the Americans are doing. This is all smokescreen. He's going to explain to you right at the beginning of the book about smoke screening, so you can watch the TV like I do, and you can recognize what's just a game and what's real. So another question for you is, what about the secret space programs? Wouldn't some of the elite just move off planet? <clears throat> well, there's stories about people going to Mars. There's people, people beaming to Mars, you know, like Star Trek, right, right. stuff like that. Um, the problems that they're going to that we're going to have here is going to be they're going to have throughout the solar system. They're not going to get away by getting in a spaceship, and they wouldn't want to do that anyway. They want to stay right here. The Georgia Guidestones agenda is going to be fulfilled by the Black Star. They're going to have their their 500 million, the the world population to grow. At least that's their plan. They've already got a, their plan laid out here. If they were just going to get in a ship and go, one thing is far too many of them of the elite. Well, 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 what I don't understand too, you know, and I'm very familiar with the Georgia Guidestones, is you know the 500 million left or whatever. Um, but isn't the world, if you know, if all these you know massive geomagnetic and you know geodidactic, all these changes occur around the globe, you know, on the planet, and it's destroyed and vaporized, and we have you know magma in the air, we have you know nuclear waste and contamination everywhere. I mean, how is the planet even livable? That's where the alien part comes in, and and, and I don't like really going there. It freaks people out. But no, it, no, no, please do. This is a secret group. We, 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 we can handle it here. Okay. Well, the, the, same, the, the same people that piloted the chariot of fire that picked up Elijah and took him to heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2, start at verse 10, then uh, those are the people that are here right now. They are here. They are very close to us right now. They're not going to interfere. But whenever this happens, then they are the ones that are going to clean up the mess. The other thing is, this is going to sound a little strange too, AI that is running this under, underground uh, real world simulation, it's not created by people. It was given to them right. by the aliens. So the elite have been working with the aliens for a long time. A lot of what you think is a UFO, a spaceship, is reverse technology that yeah. the Americans, the Russians, they have, have been doing. But the tech, the tech was given to them by the aliens, correct? That's right. So what you're dealing with is a silicon based life form. Right. And uh, that's, it, it could be a, a Trojan horse type deal. 
they, you know, I don't know if they know what they have over there, but um, that's what they're using. And the same aliens are the ones that are already here. They, they've been here millions and millions of years. They're actually not extraterrestrial. They're actually, actually terrestrial. They're actually from here. And uh, this is God's little safe haven. This is where he's doing his thing, and they're helping him do it. So this is all part of God's plan. That's why it's in the scriptures. The elite are going to lose. They're actually digging their own graves, is what they're doing. Yeah, but, if, I mean, nobody wins if, if you know, 95% of the world's population. No, the world, it, we're on the threshold of something very glorious of what's going to happen here. The world's going to be purified by water and fire, and it's going to start over again. And then we're going to have about 3,600 years to the end of the age. It's going to be the most glorious time this earth has seen. Biggest no, kingdom. Be golden age is what you're saying. It's going to be great. It's going to be, people are going to live to be very old. They're going to sleep in the woods, don't care about anything. You're not, you're not going to have the type of situation that you have now. Satan's going to be chained. And the sons of God are going to be occupying those heavenly places and helping Elijah restore all things. We're getting ready for the restoration of all things here. But it begins with an enema. <laughs> so we're going to go through that first. Rex, do you have any thoughts? Like, I was going to say, I mean, this is, this is some great information and what you've brought to the table. I certainly appreciate it. It's nice to see the charts and the data put together. Now, one thing that I do find fascinating is as far as the global things that are going on right now, I remember I talked to Dane Wigington a couple years ago, and he was telling me that even Siberia was at an all-time high as far as the heat is considered. So I'm wondering if, you know, if it does get hot enough to where these giant icebergs in Alaska and around the world start to just completely melt, there's nothing left, there's probably going to be other parts of the world that they're going to create a, you know, glaciers as well, right? It's still going to be the same thing, just different pockets of the planet, essentially. It's kind of like a system is what I'm seeing once this is all done. Are you talking about in the future? Yes. After the black star leaves. Well, the, the reason that you're seeing all this depletion is because of the way the metal is distributed and the, the elect, extra electromagnetism. So the sun is not going to sleep. The sun is being drained of its energy, but it's being redirected through those magnetic portal connections based on near proximity. So since it's getting closer and closer to us, then the earth is getting hotter and hotter. 2017 will be the hottest year on record. Just like 2016 was the hottest year on record. Just like 2015. It's going to keep getting hotter every year. The, the ocean temperatures, what you have trapped around the ocean right now at the equator is record hot temperatures, hot water that cannot make it back north because the ocean conveyor is broken. So as long as this scenario, and that should lead to the, the uh, rebuilding of the northern ice sheets. When the ocean conveyor breaks, the hot water can't go north. That causes the rebuilding, but that's not happening. You still have record low um, ice formations up there, and it's getting worse and worse. And it's going to continue because Earth is heating from the inside. When you read that grim report from the Russians, you'll see Earth is actually expanding. Because this magma displaces, I'm not, I'm not kidding you, this is highly pressurized, glassy-type magma in the transition zone, and when it rises up, it expands. It really expands. It's creating more, a bigger Earth for us. But when the black star leaves, this stuff is going to reverse. As it gets further away, it's going to have less influence. You know, I just want to say one of my favorite songs by Bon Jovi is Going down in a blaze of glory. <laughs> we got so much going on right now, man. I'm telling you, it's, it's incredible. And I've heard so many different things from different people, but you certainly have a good connection there. One of the things, though, that I always have a, you know, I've got red flags that automatically come up. And I'm just going to play devil's advocate here for a minute. When somebody tells me, all the, okay, you're gonna, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. And then aliens or an off-world faction is going to fix everything up and it's going to be just fine because it was talked about in prophecy or that's our version of the definition of prophecy. That, to me, is more like a carrot at the end of the stick. I, I almost feel like they've been kind of, keeping this over our, dangling this over our shoulder now for so long because it's something they can continue to do because it literally attaches people at the reptilian level. When I say reptilian, I'm talking about the reptilian mind where we're thinking of fight or flight. And it seems like it's every four years that this gets really intense. So as, as much as it sounds like it's going to be a global event, I wonder if there's other factions that are actually causing these events and they use this kind of as a diversion tactic. not saying it's not there, but maybe they use it at specific times to, to do other things. For example, CERN, like they're using CERN to create these fluctuations in, in the earth and the scalar squares technology, the harp stuff. So you think that maybe the elite are doing all this and the Planet X phenomenon is all hoax and that there's really not a black star coming and that actually men are doing all this. Is that your position? As no, my, posi my position is I'm agnostic. I certainly don't know. I've just seen enough out there to say there are other possibilities. If you've seen the film Wag the Dog, for example, they create a fake war to divert attention. And I've just noticed the patterns because I keep track of events, current events, certain articles, news, like pretty darn intense. And I have for years. And one thing that I've noticed is these cycles of every four years, it seems, they, they kind of use this specific topic 
And I wonder why they do that, why it's not all the time, but it seems to be on these patterns of four years. Oh, I couldn't speculate on that, but what I'm showing you on the screen here is Earth magnetosphere. This right here is the bow shock. The sun is over on your right. You see the little circle in the middle? That's the sun. What spooks me out personally even more than the dark star that's talked about, and this is a little bit more along the lines of my research over the past six years at least. I used to get into this a lot more with nanotechnology, mind control combined with nanotechnologies, and it was all basically a hypothesis associated with AI interface. You know, I talk about DNA breaking down into a quad code system, how there's sacred geometry found throughout the universe, how quantum physics, there's really no finite point. Just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And if space is infinite, then size doesn't really matter. In a sense, how could one thing be bigger than the other in infinite space? What he gets into is somebody that he actually used to work with that helped build over 200 harp-like facilities around the world. The information he talks about with the artificial interface, the nanotechnologies combined with the chemtrails, they're not actually nano goblins in the sense of being full-on nano robots at first, but the way they combine with the DNA and other elements, they can essentially turn into these micro antennas. The geoengineering of the planet, we talk about the radiation levels increasing, how and why it feels more intense on your skin when the sun reaches the skin, even though the temperatures are the same. The Anunnaki, we get in deep into the Anunnaki interface, who they are, how they've been talked about in different biblical prophecies and scriptures with different names, different terms. How Terrell also feels that over the next certain amount of years, depending on when these events absolutely do take place, in his opinion, he thinks that they will. He thinks it's going to be like the movie 2012, and California is a very bad place to be, in his opinion. Magna waves, the heliosphere shrinking, the reversing magnetosphere, what's going to happen around May 20th, 2017, connecting numbers, earthquakes, earth changes seamlessly and efficiently. This might be the podcast that changes your mind on the possibility of a binary star that causes huge events, and many consider this being, God, this being God's reset button. He also talks about where the earth change warning signs will be if you're in the U.S. and what to look for. So make sure to listen to that. Is the president of the Council of Foreign Relations actually the enforcer of U.S. control in Denver? What about the Bilderberg Group, the House of Foreign Relations, the House of Rothschild? Is the Georgia Guidestones 500 million people, no more than that, at any given time on the planet of Earth? A precursor to the Black Star Nemesis Wormwood Planet X Nibiru. What's going to happen? Is it even worth living through these cataclysms? This is discussed with Terrell as well as Jay here today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. If you become a contributing member at leakproject.com, you'll get access to exclusive content and contributions greatly help Leak Project. Pick up a high resolution decal today for 10 bucks as well. High quality vinyl. We've got several other really cool decals coming up here soon. Check them out on our website, leakproject.com. Also check out Terrell's website once again, terrell03.com. He's also on YouTube. Just look up the Dark Star and Jay Campbell, trtrevolution.com. The Game Changer with Testosterone Replacement Therapy. Enjoy the presentation. This is Rex Bear. Question everything and be the change you want to see. Guys, what is going on? It is Jay Campbell from trtrevolution.com and the author of the Definitive Testosterone Replacement Therapy Manual. And of course, I'm joined by my awesome friend, Rex Bear of The Leak Project. This is the episode, Decoders of Truth, episode 14. And we have, we're joined tonight by a very special guest. It is Terrell of terrell03.com. And Terrell is a very, very prominent guy in the, um, I guess you would call it black star orbital passage, or, orbital passage um, theory of uh, an inbound body. And we're going to let him talk a lot about that tonight. 
So again, um, we're very, very excited, both Rex and I. Uh, Terrell, how are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. Doing very good. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, so let's just get right into it. So I want, you know, uh, Rex and I are going to do our job of kind of going back and forth and having questions for Terrell. And Terrell, you probably know Rex interviews a lot of guys like you who have stories about the brew, you know, Gerald Clark, Marshall Masters, Steve Olson, all these different guys out there. Um, so he's, you know, really excited to interview you. So let's just talk a little bit about your background first. How did you get into this? I'm actually a Bible guy. I'm a more of a theologian, a, a Bible scholar, a student, and worked with scripture for decades. Thought that would be my life's work. Wrote my book in 2005, The Mystery Explained. You can get it free at terralow3.com. And then uh, once that was completed, the burden was on my heart to know the truth about 9-11. So that was a five-year investigation. And then wrote that book in 2010. And uh, you get that free also, The 9-11 Truth, Exposing the Cheney Rumsfeld Black Operation. And then uh, Allen and Comet was discovered. And after keywording scripture and the 9-11 Commission Report, Arden County After Action Report, then in developing these skills, then uh, the documentation came out about the Ellen and Comet discovered December 10th, 2010. Ellen and backwards is 9-11. And the perihelion date of this, uh, this supposed comet was 9-11-2011, exactly 10 years to the day after the 9-11 attacks. So I just wrote the book, and then here comes this story. So it was the documentation relating to Ellen and that really got me into it. I joined two astronomy groups, want to know more, educate myself on astronomy more. And then um, Minister Armour Bossage came out with his paper to Cornell April 11th. He traced uh, this Ellen and Comet, was included in his paper that he'd been working on for a very long time. And he traced the seismic pattern going back to 1965, which obviously didn't happen because of a comet. Just so happens, this celestial object, this object gravitational magnetic anomaly that I've been tracking now for the last six years was in Leo at the same time as the Ellen and Comet. And I believe that Ellen and Comet is a lettered agency PSYOP that they ran to desensitize people, very similar to the, the Comet ISON. And um, so I've been engaged in the documentation and then we pick up a, our project astronomer, uh, Don, and work with a large research group for years. And it, it, it just kind of grabbed me and uh, I'm gonna be on this project until it's finally resolved. There's definitely something coming, definitely something coming. It's causing the earth changes. It's causing um, everything from global warming to Jupiter's liquefying core to uh, the volcanism you're seeing, the earthquakes in the quake pattern that we're seeing, the magnetopause reversals that we've been having. We're predicting them now in advance because we have enough baseline data. And um, that's really how I got into the uh, investigation. So, so let me ask you a real quick question. So you're saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that Ellen and, and Ison are both psyops and they're both, they're both a cover story for the same thing, which is the inbound object, which you call I'm, No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. Ellen and passed on through the okay. seismic pattern continued. So the reason, the, the way that they use these psyops is to desensitize the population. Though so you've heard Nibiru, Planet X, the lettered agencies are running both sides of that. And everybody's hearing it so much that they're becoming desensitized to it. So the plan is to put everybody to sleep and to make them look at Hillary and Trump and whatever's the reruns are running on the television rather than waking up about what's coming from space. Okay, so, you, so, I, so if I'm understanding you correctly, again, I apologize. So you're saying that Ellen was a comet it did pass through. So no, Ison was a comet. Elenin was not a comet. Okay, try to, okay. Just try to find a picture of it. Okay. I, I got you. I got you. So, so right. Elenin was this black star, mm -hmm. but Ison was a comet. That's right. Okay. But right. there's a lot of similarities. They were both discovered by Russians. The first hyperbolic comet discovered by a Russian was, was Elenin. And the second one would have been Ison, except for they ran out of time. There's a 72-hour time limit for them to get... Um, uh, corroboration from other astronomers and they missed it by about two hours of identifying this thing as a comet. So that's why it was named after the network, the ISON network. Turned out to be a dirty snowball, but uh, James McCanny ran with that and it was a mini solar system. If you remember, both of them were mini solar systems. If you look up the, the keywording for the documentation on both of them and too many similarities for them not to be connected. And it, it was another desensitizing op that the lettered agencies ran. If you notice, McCanny left Planet X movement shortly after after that. So he, he was used as a vessel for a little while. And then he, like Lucas that came before him, if you've been watching John Moore, listening to John Moore, then it was Lucas 2011. I remember Lucas. Yeah. I interviewed him and, back in the day. And he was really big into it. He came to Revolution Radio where, where I do my work. And um, then he was replaced by James McCanny. And I expected him, them to replace McCanny with someone else, a little higher level NASA type guy. You know, that, that didn't happen. But um, both of those were psyops. Uh, used to desensitize the population in my mind. You know, let me jump in real quick because I've often thought that 
the desensitization process started way before even 2003. Because if you play Cry Wolf long enough, eventually no one's going to believe it. And even if they do believe it, they just don't want to hear it anymore because they've heard it for so long. So like you said, it's this desensita uh, desensitization process. But let me ask you this. As far as the charts and stuff that you're going to share with us here, and the, I, I had a whole bunch of earthquake reports the other day that somebody sent in. I'm talking dozens around the West Coast, all the way up into Alaska. And then you've got the Ring of Fire, obviously. Are we going to get to a point to where you think that it's going to be similar to the film 2012 on the West Coast? Absolutely. It's going to happen. The dominoes are already stacked against the U.S. West Coast in the entire United States. After that, after Yellowstone pops, then you have lava tubes running over to the New Madrid. And New Madrid's going to pop. If you look at the Scali maps of the future, look at the Navy maps of the future, you'll see a giant hole out there where you guys live. And you're going to see there's an inland gulf from where Louisiana used to be all the way up to the Great Lakes. So the United States is going to be cut in two by what's about to happen. I've seen those maps. And I know that even Edgar Casey had a basically a vision where he was in one of his trances and he had a similar map to the released Navy maps. And a lot of people that were in the military, higher in, you know, top brass, et cetera, officers ended up moving out towards that location that's looked at as safer. And, you know, definitely you want to be at a high elevation if something like that happens. But where are we at now? I mean, are there some charts essentially that kind of show where the dark star is at? Because so many people are thinking what they take a picture of is Planet X or Nibiru or Wormwood or, you know, these multiple names, Red Kachina, Blue Kachina, et cetera. Right. And that's a lot of the propaganda. There are no pictures of the black star. There's no pictures of the black star. You cannot photograph what is a black hole. This thing is more like a black hole than any known celestial object. So it's like sucking stuff into another dimension? No, I'm not going to say that. What we're dealing with is- That a sounds crazy awesome. This is a remnant body. This is the, our sun's much larger binary twin that burned out long, long, long time ago. And when it imploded, then it created this remnant body that comes to the inner solar system. It came to the inner solar system in the days of 